Um, Sophocles, whose Ajax we just read, wrote 124 plays in 62 years. That's two plays a year, every year, for his dramatic career. We have seven of those plays left, and you just read one of them. He won a first prize 18 times, far more than either of his competitors, Aeschylus or Euripides. Today, we move to Euripides Hecuba, which is written about 25 years after the Ajax. Sophocles, greatest legacy, perhaps, to the Western dramatic world is the concept of the hero that he intensified from Homer. There are heroes in all seven plays that, he, that survive, Ajax obviously being one of them. Euripides wrote about 80 plays, of which we have 18 left. 18 have survived. A huge number compared to Sophocles or Aeschylus, of whom we each have only seven. So you are reading one of those 18 plays, and we will see um, some of that in action this morning in a few minutes. In those 18 plays, there are no heroes. Sophocles is full of heroes. Euripides has none. Euripides lived during the heart of the Peloponnesian War, the, war, the 27 year war between Athens and Sparta from 431 to 404. <coughs> It would be like trying to write about heroism if you were a soldier in Iraq. There is heroism, but it's a very muted kind of heroism. It's not the larger than life Antigone, Ajax, Oedipus kind of heroism. It's the kind of heroism of Polyxena and the Hecuba. So we're, we're making a big shift here, and we're, we're shifting into darkness as well. Ajax has a certain personal sadness to it because a great man is boxed in by something that he's learned from the military industrial complex and he suffers dearly for it as our veterans and warriors do today. With Euripides, the only heroism that you see in any of his 18 plays is always female and it's always young females like Polixen in this play, almost not even teenagers, usually 13 and 14 year old girls. Why would that be? It's an interesting question for you to think about. Why, what is it that Polixen has about her that Odysseus and Agamemnon and Menelaus in this play and other plays don't have? And why is it that Odysseus is a complete scoundrel in this play, whereas the play we just read, Ajax, he's quite a hero. So from the Odysseus of the Odyssey and the Ajax, all of a sudden, we have a complete scoundrel, a scheming trickster of the worst sort. What has happened to Odysseus? What has happened to Euripides' world? Why aren't there any heroes anymore? So that's an important question. Um, this play is very simply structured. In the first half, an old woman, the queen of Troy, now a slave, laments the death of her daughter, and in the second half of the play, she laments the death of a son, and there seems to be no causal connection between the two halves of the play. Perhaps the most important question that could be asked of this play is what links these two murders, one by Greeks, one by Trojans, that are completely causally unrelated. There's like two halves of the play in the Ajax, and they are clearly causally related. We have a, a guy commit suicide, and then we see the struggle to bury him. The second half clearly dependent on the first half. In the Hecuba, we have two halves of a play that seem causally unrelated. What's going on? What links them together? Something for you to think about, um, perhaps in section discussion. So as we talk about the moral vacuity moral emptiness, the slavery to the mob that is so evident in the Hecuba, we think about the man whose funeral was held yesterday in Boston, who for 20 years was the mayor of Boston and has turned it into one of the most interesting cities in America. 
Tom Menino was certainly the most honest politician in America, maybe the most honest man in America. It's said that he met half of the citizens of Boston in his 20 years. Um, <clears throat> so when we think about the Hecuba and we think about what moral le leadership isn't, we think about Tom Menino and we think about what moral leadership is. Here's the cover of the globe today. Final salutes. Thousands and thousands of people were in Daniel Hall um, this past weekend and then yesterday at the church. Joe Biden, Elizabeth Warren, Bill Russell, David Ortiz, um, Pedro Martinez. Everybody loved this guy. Um, the thing about Tom Menino that relates to the Hecuba This is the editorial of the Globe today. Menino, the master of power. The last few days of outpouring of affection for the late Tom Menino is more, <clears throat> is more than deserving, but tells us little really about why he was so effective as a mayor. As hagiography eventually gives way to biography, one thing we will learn, I believe, is that his, his success was not merely his love of people, dedication to Boston, tireless work ethic, or sharp intellect. It was his ability to accumulate power, to wield it, and to put it to good ends. Few politicians know how to do so. Menino was a master. And Menino also surrounded himself with advisors and staff who understood, as he did, the importance of building and maintaining power. But power without purpose is pointless. It's a good line, and we should keep it in mind as we read the Pecu book. Menino had an exceptionally well-developed sense of fairness and empathy for downtrodden and outcasts, for gays and lesbians, for minorities, for women, for immigrants. He understood the need to mesh the new with the old. He believed cities had to be safe, a necessary prerequisite to keeping and building their residential and business bases. He knew that education mattered most of all <clears throat> to the least well-off. It was their path out of poverty. He used the power he had accumulated to make progress on all these fronts and more. It wasn't only his caring that Menino leads as a legacy, it was his ability to lead to, to get things done. So I speak about Tom Menino not only because he was the mayor of this city for the last 20 years and really put it on a map in a new way, but also because Tom Menino, after he left office, signed on to the BU faculty to lead a new institute called the Initiative for Cities. <clears throat> and so now the Boston Scholars <coughs> Program is called the Menino Scholars Program. So as we think about the Hecuba and we think about power, it's good to think that there are people who can use power in a beneficent way. I introduce to you now Tina Hamill, who is sort of everything to the core. She developed the MFA guide. She's an author. She just produced a play, Letters from Medford. She's uh, a dear friend and true great colleague in court. Thank you. wonderful to hear about Menino. I would actually say every single young woman in this office did not do your duty in lamentation for him, which is one of the things we're going to talk about today, which is if we were in 5th century Athens, you should have been crying at the side of him um, for him. And uh, so I'm going to start today by talking about lamentation. We've seen a lot of examples of it in um, Ajax. We're going to see a lot of examples of it in Hecuba. And this is turning the focus a little bit from all these heroes we've been looking at to see the women behind them, something that we haven't really looked at too much, especially Tecmessa, especially Hecuba, Polixena, all these women in the background that have a role to perform, which is to mourn for these heroes who are dying. And so I want to just talk about a little, little couple of historical examples here. We're going to be looking at more of them next week when we start to read Thucydides. So to start to talk about lamentation, in the 6th century Athenian statesman Solon legislated that gestures of lamentation had to be controlled and occur inside and outside of the home. So by the 6th century, he's 
actually dictating how women should mourn. It should happen inside and not outside. And usually when laws are established, it's because something is happening to push a change in that law. Perhaps there's too many women on the outside mourning. Customs would include uh, to lament the dead. Women would wash, dress, and lay out the body. Lamentation took place inside the home or in the funeral procession. The funeral had to be the next day or no longer than the sunrise of the third day. I'll just remind you, these are laws that were instigated. No women who were not family members could participate unless they were 60 years or older. Disorderly lamentation was not allowed. And this actually makes us think about Ajax when he orders Tecmessa to take the child away and he says to her, don't keep up this weeping and wailing in front of the hut. Truly she's prone to pity and want to wail a woman. So even he's self-conscious of the fact that she's lamenting outside rather than inside. The reason for the rules were to ensure that lamentation was a discreet family event and not an occasion for elaborate displays of feminine grief. Greek women were articulating not only their grief, but perhaps even in some way expressing their anger and their blame for those who were responsible for the death of their loved ones. Other potentially subversive acts of lamentation would be the fact that these women were focusing on their grieving too much, not on the actual dead. Perhaps there was too much of blaming of the agent of death and privileging family loyalties over the loyalty to the state. So I just wanted to bring up this example because this, this capture of uh, Miletus was actually turned into a play in 494 BC. We get a, a reference to it in Herodotus. And this turns into a play and uh, the Persians besieged Miletus, which was a colony of Athens. So a, a very interesting example um, is given forth by Herodotus. The Persians besieged Miletus, which is a colony of Athens. They took the city in 494 BCE, and all of the inhabitants were killed or enslaved. In 492, the playwright Phrynichus stages a play called The Capture of Miletus, and Herodotus records that the Athenian audiences wept so much during the performance that Phrynichus, the playwright, was fined for his play, a thousand drachmas, for reminding the people of their own evils, reminding them of what they had done, reminding of them what had happened, and he was ne this play was never allowed to be performed again. So we don't have a copy of this play. We just have this reference to it. And uh, other than um, Aeschylus' Persians, every other play that we have does not talk about contemporary events. Every other play takes mythos, takes the mythic characters of Homer or other myths, and places them in the context of 8th, 5th century Athens. So mythos replaces memorial. So, so we, it's too hard to watch actual current events on stage. We have to take mythical characters like Hecuba, like Ajax, and put them on stage to stand in for 5th century preoccupations or for the emotions for 5th century Athens. So that's what we're doing when we look at Ajax and when we look at Hecuba. So today I want to focus, and with the help of the Hecuba players down here in the front row, I want to focus on how Hecuba grieves and how she's ultimately able to gain strength to get revenge. Because if she did her role as a woman, she would just be lamenting the whole time. And I think you'll all notice, if you've read the play, it gets kind of hard to listen to. It's just troubles after troubles after troubles. And how can more bad things happen to this woman? All of a sudden, there's a pivot point and she takes revenge. So I want, to, I want uh, to talk about that a little bit. Even within the play, we can see that Euripides, who was very much um, one who empathized with the other side, has some contemporary issues that are going on here. In classical Athenian tragedy, it's conventional for the women to react to the death of a loved one. And here we have in lines five, uh, 650 to 656, the chorus of Trojan women talking about a Spartan girl. And I want you to just remind you that this is during the Pel Peloponnesian War, where Athens is at war with Spartan. So to say Sparta, or to say a Spartan girl, is quite a loaded thing. Trojan women talking about contemporary women who are being enslaved. And here's the, um, here's the passage. Some Spartan girl 
with many tears at home, also groans around a fair flowing Eurotus, and upon her own gray head, the mother of dead children, sets her hand, claws her cheek, setting her bloody nails for mangling. So here the Trojan women are talking about the Spartan women in the middle of the Peloponnesian War where Athens and Sparta are fighting. So I just want you to remember that. Your, um, Euripides is very much interested in taking these mythical characters and setting contemporary issues with them. So Euripides, Hecuba, is produced at the height of the Peloponnesian War. Again, we're going to talk a little bit more about this next week, but the dates of the Peloponnesian War are 431 to 404. So this is right in the middle of it. Of all the victims of Troy, Hecuba lost the most. She lost her husband, she lost her children, she lost her city. And I've given you some of the names of her children on the handout there. In the play, we see three acts of extraordinary violence occur. The murder of Polydorus before the play begins, we hear about it. The sacrifice of Polyxena by the Greek soldiers, this is a democratic vote to do this. And the blinding of Polymester and the murder of the two sons. We don't see any of this happen on stage, it all happens off stage. Men's violence in the first half gives way to women's violence against men in the second half. In the first half, a mob of men vote democratically, an assembly of citizens, of Trojan citizens, come together and vote democratically that Polyxena should die. And in the second half, we lose the law, and we have Hecuba take the law into her own hands and get revenge and kill Paul Polymester and murder his two sons. So he um, Hecuba, as Professor um, Esposito pointed out, is structured. In, very, in two very dynamic ways. Part one has the pathos, where we feel bad and mourn or, or empathize with Hecuba and see her reversal from queen to slave. In the second half, we have persuasion and rhetoric, where she convinces Agamemnon and convinces herself to get revenge for the death of her son Polydorus. So I want you to think about this, Professor. Ms. Vizito kind of mentioned this. What laws operate in this universe? I mean, you could ask the same question of Ajax. What laws are operating? And I think what we see here is that we have Homeric values and values of classical Athens in conflict. And we can see them in both of these plays. I'm going to focus, of course, on Hecuba. So what laws are operating in this universe? And you might even ask the question, are there any laws at all in Hecuba? To look ahead a little bit to next week, perhaps some of you have already read the Mytilenean debate, which is a, a debate that is um, described by Thucydides. The rebellion took place in 428, that's four years before the performance of Hecuba at Athens. And in it, the Mytilenians, who were um, <coughs> citizens on the island of Lesbos, rebelled against Athens. Remember, our Professor Kleiner told us how Athens had changed the um, treasury to go from the island of Delos over to, uh, to Athens, and uh, now people are starting to rebel. And they rebelled against Athens. And I won't give it all away, but I will let you enjoy, let you enjoy reading that debate. How the Mytilenean men of military age were all going to be put to death, and everybody else would be uh, enslaved. And so there's a debate that happens. Should we do this? Is this a good idea? And I think that the debate that happens with Polyxena is very similar to this. In fact, we can see that Euripides actually sounds a little more like Thucydides than Homer, despite the fact that there are Homeric characters. That there's a debate about whether or not we should be killing these people. I mean, it's very ironic. I hope you understand the irony of, of, of Athenian citizens watching this happen on stage. So in the Mytilenean debate, the city is almost destroyed, and at the last minute, in true dramatic uh, structure, they change their mind and they go sailing off and say, and just at the last minute, they say, no, we're not going to kill everybody, we're only going to kill a thousand. And then they raise the city, destroy the city, they confiscate all the ships of the city, and they divide up the land and take it. The Athenians get most of it, they give the gods the rest. This is happening for, this is, we'll call it a current event, happening four years before Hecuba was performed on stage. So the enactment of law becomes public in the theater. The discussion of law, the debate of law, becomes public in the theater, and Athenian citizens who are watching it 
perhaps he participated with it himself. The play becomes a critical consciousness of what Athens was doing at the time. So, let's talk about women and grief as a woman. This is a detail from a funerary crater. Um, this is at the Museum of Modern Art, Metropolitan Museum of Modern Art, some of their fantastic um, geometric era craters. This is a, a depiction of women mourning the death. And you can see just, um, I do have a laser here. So you can see that this, this sort of crisscross is the funeral shroud laid over. They have it purposely laid over so it's not actually covering the body. It becomes a, a design feature. And the body laid out with women taking their positions of mourning in a kind of gesture of grief. So it becomes a very, the, the whole system of funerary processions and funerary um, rituals becomes quite important and quite ritualized, quite set up. Um, it appears that the artist's concern is to specify gender, where women and children stand over the body, and men are going to be the ones who fight. So lower down in the crater, in another register, we can see here that the men actually become the shields. So where women's role is to mourn, the men's role is to fight. They actually become their shields. And this always reminds me of Ajax, Professor Esposito talking about Ajax as being a shield himself when I think of him. And this crater is so interesting because it's dated as actually just around the time we situate Homer as well. This other register is also nice because it shows the women at the top mourning and the men fighting. So that's, that's as early as 750 BC, we see these roles being established. And I'm going to go through and show you some examples of how these roles are going to be reinforced over the next few hundred years. This is 200 years later. This is what's called the pro uh, prothesis scene where we have the deceased surrounded by family. And if you look, you can see here the men have a very particular gesture. They hold their hands out to the dead, where the women put their head on the, it's a little faded out here, but put their head on, hands on their head in a gesture of mourning. And it's often described as the women tearing out their hair. So you can see here, the men hold their hand out, the women hold their hands at their hair. So the Greek funeral was composed of, three step, of a three-step procedure. The prosthesis, which is the laying out of the body, and this was done uh, to pre prepared by the women. So this was the women's role. The second was the ekphora, which is the carrying out of the corpse from house to tomb. This is the men's job. And the expositor, the depositing of its cremated or in human arm and its remains, was also done by the men after the funeral procession. This is another example, and this is a nice register because it shows men, women, and really probably where the how he died here in the war. And we see this very this done in Ajax very quickly. When in the scene, um, Tecmessa will take her place as the mourning woman, and will have no lines left in the play. Her last line is mourning at line 9 and 73. That's it. That's her job for the rest of the play, to mourn. And Tusser will tell her what she's supposed to do. Tusser will say, um, or text message just before her last line, she says, what shall I do? Which of your friends will lift you up? Where is Tusser? If he should come now, how timely his arrival would be. Then he could join in the burial rites of the fallen brother. Oh, ill-fated Ajax, in what a state you are for the man you are, how worthy you are, even in your enemies' eyes, to receive lamentations. For them, you see, Ajax lives no longer. For me, he is gone, completely gone, leaving only misery and mourning. And that's her last line. So we can see this accelerated funeral happening here in between the arrival of Agamemnon and the arrival of Menelaus. And Tusser has to do this really quickly. The man has to move the body, the woman has to mourn. Tusser then tells the boy to hold on as a suppliant and don't you chorus of sailors. He says, don't stand there like a woman crying. <coughs> so we see this funeral in Ajax. So how does it show up? I want to just digress a little bit.
to uh, another world that we were looking at at the beginning of the semester to show you that this is not just happening in the Greek Homeric world uh, and the Greek um, uh, classical world, but this is also happening in the um, world of Hebrews as well. And in Lamentations, I'm going to take a side step here to the Hebrew Bible, and one of the other cultures we've looked at, in the book of Lamentations, the response to the destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonians, you've heard about this, the military occupation that destroys the first temple in 586 BCE. The constant question of the book of Lamentations is how could this happen to God's beloved city, a sacred city? A sacred city we've been hearing about in Troy as well. And here, this is, becomes a metaphor. The city becomes a metaphor for the mourning woman. This is Jerusalem, not Hecuba, but it sounds very much like it. How lonely stands the city that once was full of people. How like a widow she has become. She was once great among nations. She who is queen among the provinces has now become a slave. This is Jerusalem. It sounds very much like Hecuba. The Lord has rejected all the warriors in my midst and has summoned an army against me to crush my young men. This is why I weep and my eyes overflow with tears. Still talking about the city of Jerusalem. My children are destitute because the enemy has prevailed. Zion stretches out her hands, but there is no one to comfort her. So I wanted to just point out here how Lamentations has very similar gestures of grief. and actually tells you how to grieve. You overflow with tears, you stretch out your hands. There's an art to mourning. Nobody did this, probably, at Menino's funeral. It emphasizes the function of women in the rituals of mourning and establishes these gendered behaviors that I've been talking about. So how does it compare with Hecuba's speech? How is she as a mourner, as a lamenter? Um, does she lament the loss of her husband? Does she lament the loss of her children and the city equally? If you take a look on page 85, lines 155 through 60, I think, I, no, I don't, I don't, come back here. Notice how many questions she has. How unhappy I am. What should I shout? What kind of cry? What kind of lament? Who protects me? What family? What city? She has a lot of questions, a lot of rhetorical questions. Who is going to take care of her now? And how is she going to lament? Her tears swell up, her arms go out. There's no comfort in this situation. So look for the language of lament as you're working um, through Hecuba. There's one more example. I'm not going um, to pass through it with Jeremiah, who is also always known as the weeping prophet. Um, I've given this to you in your handout, so I'll let you look this up. But the God also says how you know, the city is going to be destroyed now. Now, you women, open your ears to the word of the Lord. Teach your daughters how to wail. Teach each other, each other how to lament. In the Odyssey, I'll just remind you once again, now we've got this real gendering of lamentation and weeping with Odysseus. Professor Esposito gave you a lot of attention to this. Weeping, the way a wife mourns for her lord on the lost field where he has gone down fighting. She goes bound into slavery and grief. Piteous weeping wears away her cheeks. There's no more piteous than Odysseus. So the difference between Homer and 5th century Athens is that actually men seem to cry quite a bit in Homer. And it seems to be okay. Odysseus cries quite a bit. Achilles in the Iliad cries quite a bit. When he's lamenting for the loss of Patroclus, he becomes woman-like, rolls on the ground, rubs ashes in his hair. This is how he mourns for Patroclus. This becomes a problem. I'm looking ahead to Plato's Republic. This is exactly the problem that Plato and Socrates have with Homer, that men could do this. How could you have a soldier do this? We will once more entreat Homer and the other poets not to depict Achilles, who is the son of a goddess, to lie on his side, then on his back, then on his face, then starting up and sailing in a frenzy along the shores of the barren sea, taking the sooty ashes in both hands and pouring them over his head, or weeping and wailing in the various modes which Homer has delineated. This is from Book 3. No, no, not for the men. Not now. Tell 
Alcibiades tells us that Hecuba does exactly the same thing on line nine, uh, 495. Her entire city was raised by the spear, and she herself a slave lies on the ground defiling dirt with her wretched head. So Achilles and Hecuba have something in common. The difference is, in classical Athens, that's what a woman should do, and it's not what a man should do. So Hecuba is sort of stuck in time, mourning. Um, and so I fast forward and I've given you the Rape of Lucrece, an excerpt from Shakespeare's The Rape of Lucrece, where there's a painting of Hecuba, I'm focusing a lot on visual culture here, and Lucrece finds comfort in actually looking at images of Hecuba mourning. So Hecuba is going to be stuck in time as a mourner. In the poem, the burden of Lucrece's grief becomes a solace, and she finds comfort in actually looking at images of Hecuba. So you actually have this on your handout. Many, to find a face where all the stress is stelled, many she sees whose cares have carved some, but none where all distress and dolor pain well. Since she despairing Hecuba, till, excuse me, till she despairing Hecuba beheld, staring on Priam's wounds with her old eyes, in her the painter had anatomized time's ruin, beauty's rack, and Grimm's cares reign. Her cheeks and chaps and wrinkles were disguised, of that she was no semblance did remain. So here we have Lucrece actually finding comfort in seeing Hecuba mourning. Hecuba will always mourn. Hamlet talks about this as well. I can't even go. There's too much to talk about. So how should this, so what this does is give us a clue of how Hecuba should be depicted on stage. If we have all of these gestures of mourning in uh, evidence of writing, and we have it in the um, art, we can have some idea of how perhaps Hecuba is performed on stage. And this beautiful piece, which some of you saw at the museum, and I think we've seen the last three lectures. Uh, I've got an excerpt here, the, the Dragon of Hector. Again, I want to show you, right? Women mourn this way, men mourn this way. This is Hecuba with her hand on her head. There's Priam with his arm reaching out. So what does it mean to see grief on stage? The theatron, the theater, is a place for seeing. There's so much wonderful language of seeing in both of these plays. When you're told by a character to look, it's talking to 10,000 audience members who are looking at something. It really means something to be, to, to be told to look while you're watching the play. It's a place to view the performance. So subtle gesture doesn't work. This is not Marlon Brando on camera here. This is not small stuff. 10,000 people watching this, you need to have big, fixed, <laughs> large voices, large masks, large bodies, fixed faces, fixed gestures, so the audience can see this. So both the art of classical Athens and the performance reinforce these roles in mourning. So I think, I think it's time, Nico, where's our peculiar players? Are you ready? We need to do a little... Okay, so, while he's getting ready, I'll just say this. In the theater, the audience is given a behind-the-scenes view. We're very privileged as audience members. In Hecuba, we get to see the ghost. Nobody else sees the ghost. Nobody else has the privilege of seeing this. So Polydorus, the son of Hecuba, actually opens up the play. And based on this knowledge, we know more than Hecuba, because we know that he's already dead. She won't know until line 681. So he's an invisible character in the play, and we, the audience members, become the jury. We're the ones that are going to listen and decide whether it's fair. Where are the laws in this play? I'm here, here, after leaving the hiding places of corpses and the gates of shadow where Hades dwells apart from the gods. I, Polydorus, was the child of Hecuba, and Priam was my father who, when there was danger that the Phrygian city fall by Greek spears, in secret 
He sent me from the Trojan land to the house of Polymestor, our Trojan guest friend, who cultivates this most fertile Chersonian land that you see here. <coughs> my father secretly sent much gold with me, so that if ever Troy's walls should fall, his living sons will not lie to with it. And since I was the youngest of Priam's sons, he also sent me to from the land, for I can bear neither armor nor spear with my young arm. So, while the country's walls remain upright, and the towers of the Trojan land were intact, and Hector, my brother, was fortunate with his spear, I grew quite well with the Thracian man, my father's guest friend. But with Troy and Hector's life are lost, and the hearth of my father was raised, and Priam himself, before the godfather altar falls, slaughtered by Achilles' son, desecrated with blood, my father's guest friend then slays me. Long suffering for the sake of gold, and then after the slaying to the salty waters, he released me, so that he could keep the gold in his house. So now, I lay upon the shore, sometimes in the seas tossing, borne along by the many cycles of waves, unlamented, unburied. Yeah. 
So it's not this. Is there anything? There's something kind of constructed or framed or kind of uh, perhaps conventionalized here in the way that women are depicted. Um, and I, this, this reminds me of Polixena when it's stated that even in death, this is line 569, even in death she planned carefully and fell with propriety, hiding what one must hide from the eyes of males. So here there is a right way and a wrong way for women to mourn. And I think this kind of depicts this beautiful, like, just example after example of women mourning. And in, with Polixena, there's a right way to die. I mean, wasn't it nice of her to cover up her body so the men weren't embarrassed when she fell after they killed her? No, you're, okay, you're not reacting to that. Okay, that's fine. I mean, I think that's pretty. Um, I'm going to fast forward to the 20th century. This is a, a dancer by the name of Martha Graham in her piece called Lamentation, and you can go to YouTube and you can see this. And she says of this piece, Lamentation, which she borrowed very much from the classical um, imagery. She said, it's a tragedy that obsesses the body, and the garment that is worn is just a tube of material, but it is as though you were stretching inside your own skin. You can't get away from the grief. You cannot get away from the grief. This black mourning clothing, you can't get away from it. Um, Telphibius will tell us at line 486 that Hecuba is on the ground laying wrapped up in her robes. There's somebody else who can't get away from the grief. You might recognize her, right? Forever the grieving woman in the Christian world. This is a piece I'd like for you to see when you go to the Museum of Fine Arts. This is on your tour. It's quite a a simple little piece, but I think she, especially when you compare it to the Martha Graham lamentation, in the iconography, it, it becomes this trapped forever to more. This is the women's role. So I'm going to show you some images, more contemporary images of women mourning in war. I'm going to just perhaps, I think trigger warning is a thing that your state nowadays. But there are some graphic images I'm going to show you of women mourning in war, especially the first Iraq war. It doesn't look that different. Mourning women in Baghdad after a spring, string of bombs killed 35 children. There's the death of Priya. She's reaching out her hands. This is a little bit later. There's another one. It's not that much different. When I talk about these as being universal gestures, there, there seems to truly be something universal about this act of mourning. Iraqi woman mourning the loss of a relative in 2006. It's not just Iraq. South Vietnamese woman mourning over the body of her husband. That's all that's left of him. One more morning gesture. So let's take a look and see how Hecuba mourns. Maybe we want to get ready.
sand or felled by a bloody spear. An ocean wave pouring from the sea. Oh no, my eye. I understand the sleepy vision of my eyes. No dark-winged ghost passed by me. The vision I saw of you, O oh child, that you no longer lived in Zeus's light. Who killed him then? Can you say by interpreting dreams? My guest friend, Polymestor, where Priam had placed him in hiding. Oh no! What will you say? He kills him to get the gold? Unspeakable, unnameable, beyond wonders, unholy, and unbearable. Where is the justice of guest friends? The most damnable of men, how you butchered his flesh, cutting with an iron knife his limbs. You did not pity this boy. O oh, suffering one, how the divinity that made you most suffering among mortals is heavy on you. Actually, we actually had two uh, women 
Young Women Play and Hecuba, because I think one of the interesting things for me in this play is how she mourns. I think we've talked about mourning quite a bit this morning. And um, then she all of a sudden has a plan, and it's almost like she's a different person. So in this scene, we had two different women play her. Um, Radhika played her as the mourning Hecuba, and Giselle played her as this woman with a plan. And I think this is something that you can talk about. You know, at what point does she get the strength to come up with this plan to get revenge? I mean, it's quite, it's quite an elaborate scheme, isn't it? She's been spending the whole part of the play pretty much mourning. And then all of a sudden, she has this articulate idea that she gives to Agamemnon. But we've only given you an extract of this scene. It's much longer. You can see how, what kind of tactics she uses. She uses tactics of law, tactics of reminding him that he's been sleeping with, that he's taken her daughter, Cassandra, as a war bride. Uh, she uses a lot of interesting tactics. So this is something you can look at. And I think this is where the kind of tensions between the Homeric world and classical Athens really start to show. That you have a character like Hecuba who belongs in the Homeric world and she mourns like she should. And all of a sudden she starts to articulate like she's a man. In the Homeric world and the classical Athens, we've got this play that's filled with dualities. We have two ghosts. We have Polydorus, and we have mention of the ghost of Achilles, who's the one who demands that Polyxena be sacrificed. We have two children of Hecuba dead, Polyxena and Polydorus. Two children of Polymaster to die, two for two. Two justice systems, public debate, which is how Polyxena was chosen to die, and vengeance, which is what Hecuba will choose. And two Greek soldiers, Odysseus, who will not help, and Agamemnon, who will help. So the purpose of all these dualities in the play is to show these tensions, the tensions between the Homeric world and the Trojan War, and the reality of Athens in the middle of the Peloponnesian War. In the Homeric world, the relationship between a guest and a host is sacred. That's what Polymestor was supposed to do, is take care of the boy. And murdering a guest is one of the worst sins imaginable. As we've been looking at in the Odyssey, that's, that's the value system, the guest host relationship. In the Homeric world, gestures of appeal and clemency are to supplicate yourself. Um, we didn't show this in our scenes, but supplication as a gesture of uh, clemency, that is, kneeling down to ask for something, means that you should get it. If you go that far to actually kneel and ask for something, whoever you're doing that to should give it to you. You remember that Odysseus does this with Arate when he shows up at the court of the Phaikians. Athena moves the mist, and there he is on his hands and knees, supplicating Arate, and they bring him in. This play is interesting because she will not supplicate Odysseus. She does supplicate Agamemnon. Agamemnon lets her have the burial. Odysseus will not let her have Polyxena. So supplication is a very important gesture here. Meanwhile, in the world of public opinion, in classical Athens, there is a fair vote on the sacrifice of Polyxena. It's a wonderful etching from the 17th century. They vote on whether or not she will die. It's a democratic exercise, and you, the audience, sit and watch as this happens. Hecuba must continually negotiate these two worlds in order to avenge, avenge her children in a world that seems less and less allowable for revenge to happen. As a citizen of the Homeric world, revenge is the obvious course. Killing the children of the man whose treachery killed her child is the action that should be carried out. And so she is really balancing between the two. By the end, we can see ultimately what she chooses. In the world of public opinion, the fair vote is not going to work for her. <coughs> uh, here is another sacrifice of Polyxena. So public debate moves the mob to sacrifice Polyxena, but her only way to publicly do anything is to lament. That's what she's supposed to do. Even Polyxena laments her own death. 
kind of performance. By the second half, though, Polydorus is discovered, and Hecuba starts to move. Something changes in her, and we see this song of vengeance that she starts to sing. I'll show you a couple of images of Polydorus. Same artist. This one's nice because it actually has the body moving from the sea up to shore. And this is a wonderful production at the Royal Shakespeare Company of Vanessa Redgrave in the body of Polydorus. You can see they don't have masks here, but they're made to look uniform, just like as if they were one kind of body of voices. And I think we're going to finish here with the final scene, which is the chorus, who, who kind of gets one of the last moments to really convince the audience of what happened at Troy. So I'll give you a second to get ready there. This is the scene that we just saw. And now we're going to see the scene of the chorus just before Polymestor gets his eyes gouged out. And I think this scene is important because it shows just what's at stake for the Trojan women and why they might participate in this act of blinding Polymestor and kill killing his children. You, O oh fatherland Ilium, will no longer be counted among the unsacked cities. Such a cloud of Greeks conceals you, sacking you spear by spear, your crown of towers packed off, stained in defilement with most miserable smoke. O oh wretched city, no longer will I set foot in you. At midnight, I was lost. But after feast, sweet sleep upon my eyes was spread, and retiring from the dances and songful offerings, he lay down, my husband, in our bedchambers, his spear shaft in its holder, no longer watching for a new brigade that had trod Ilium's Troy. I was arranging my hair, bound up the nets, beholding my golden mirrors when the screaming so I might fall into bed. But a clamor came to the city. And this was the order down from Troy's town. You, sons of Greeks, when, when after sacking the summit of Ilium, will you come to your own homes? A band in my bed barely flew like a Dorian maiden, clinging to Artemis, I wretched achieved nothing. And having seen my bed made dead, being led upon the salty sea, looking away back at the city, when the ship moved my foot from homecoming and split me from the land of Ilium. Miserable, I collapsed in pain. The sister of Clytemestra, Helen, and the herdsman of Ida, baneful Paris, I cursed them both, since the marriage blasted me from my ancestral land and made me homeless. No, not marriage, but some misery from a spirit of vengeance. May the salt sea not return her home again, oh. nor may she reach. Reach her father's house. Never. So I want to thank the heck of a player as we've been rehearsing for about five weeks. I've been 
talking a lot about mourning. By the way, just as an, a side note, at the Museum of uh, the Met, right now, there's a, a, an exhibit called Death Becomes Her, of women in the 19th century mourning, which is pretty much an industry, was a great industry unto itself. So if you're in New York, you can go and see the funeral and for and you can go and see the exhibit. Don't start getting ready yet. I can see you from here. Um, and so last year, anybody here a fan of Lady Gaga? Oh, you could say no. Um, she was mourning her dog at this time last year. And we were preparing this, and I was preparing this with the, the actors, and I couldn't help but throw up a little bit in my mouth. <laughs> uh, because of the kind of artifice of mourning that she puts on here. Sorry, that was kind of gross, but I just said it. Uh, but this is, this is, and we kind of know what her thing is, right? Her thing is all about performance. But this, this you know, meat dress, whatever, Kermit, whatever. But this one really irked me, and I just thought it was kind of funny how she is performing, really overly performing, the role of mourning here. I've left you with a lot of questions to talk about in your discussion. Questions about why Hecuba has to go through this. How Greek tragedy really asks about the moral qualities of men rather than God. Why does Athena not show up again at the end of Ajax? Where are the gods in this place? Where are the laws? Why do we like to watch suffering? Why do we like to watch spectacle of suffering? Um, and I'll leave those questions for you for your um, discussion. So I'm going to open this up for questions. And if the heck of players want to answer anything, that's great too. So thank you very much. to put a crown on the second Hecuba, but not the first Hecuba. There's a very easy question for that, because that mask is a Hecuba mask that we purchased. <laughs> we made the other ones, and it's just a fixed mask of hers. So I always think maybe we should have like torn off one of the pieces of the crown um, to make her look more disheveled, but I also wanted to show her different from the rest of the chorus. We chose this year to, to use kind of puppet masks because I wanted to, to make the chorus look like there were more than there were. I think that showed up really nicely in the third scene. Uh, to have more of that than just one mask for each character. Any other questions? Thank <laughs> you.